Monday morning, humans. Hello, humans. How are you? This is your host of Ellie 2.0, Ellie Krug. It is so great to be back with you. And if you're watching on Facebook right now, you can see me waving at you. Hello. And um, welcome to LE 2.0, your Monday morning show on idealism and on what it means to be a hopeless idealist, to be idealistic in this world of ours where we are trying to make our way in a variety of ways. If you're new to the show, LE 2.0, if you're new here, um, I am Ellie, Ellie Krug. Uh, and if you are really new and regular listeners, just bear with me, okay, as we build the show and the brand, I need to keep saying this every once in a while, and that is that you're hearing the voice of what sounds like a man, but actually I am a woman. Uh, I happen to be transgender, one of the relatively few transgender radio hosts in the world, and enough about that. So... Remember, on this show, uh, what we do is we split the show between me first talking about um, an idealist, somebody doing work to change the world in one way or another and up for the positive. And then in the second segment, I'll talk a little bit about my work as an idealist um, because I'm going around the country doing things. What I want to talk about today, the person I want to talk about is someone I'm calling an idealistic entrepreneur. Um, it is Leonard uh, Riggio, uh, who is the chairman and CEO of Barnes & Noble. Len Riggio is not a name that I knew uh, at all, although um, I was very familiar with his company, Barnes & Noble. Um, he is someone who helped Barnes & Noble go from zero to 100. And some call uh, Riggio the Ted Turner of bookstores. Just by happenstance, I heard Riggio speak in New York City Three weeks ago, I attended the annual book expo that they have in New York City. It turns out my daughter is a professional book reviewer on top of some other things, and she asked me to go to the, the book expo with her. And so I did, and on the opening morning of the, of the book expo, uh, Riggio spoke. Um, you may also recall that I'm also a published author, so I had an uh, I That was another show. I talked about my book. We don't need to go into that now, um, but... So I had another interest in going to the book expo for that reason. So Riggio was the kind of the lead off uh, speaker, the guy that helped get the book expo off the ground. And uh, uh, he's, a, he's a real New Yorker, let me tell you. He's got a classic New York accent. Um, and he talked a little bit about his story and about his, you know, what he, he, he viewed Barnes & Noble representing. And so, as he spoke, he talked about um, graduating from high school in Brooklyn in the, uh, in late, in the late 1950s and then um, going to New York University part-time uh, where he was studying metallurgical engineering. While he was in college, he took a job at one of NYU's, uh, campus, uh, at NYU's campus bookstore. Um, and so, he's, you know, a, he's a college student pursuing medical uh, excuse me, metallurgical engineering, and that's the course he's going to take. But while working in the bookstore at NYU, he realized, or at least he believed, that he could do that job better. And as that happens with many entrepreneurs, once you get the spark about running your own business or doing your own thing, uh, there's no going back. And I happen to also consider myself an entrepreneur as well. I've uh, now started three different businesses. So Riggio thought that he could do a better job than his boss. And he went out and uh, found some space um, in the neighborhood of NYU. And he opened up a competing bookstore called uh, the SBX, the Student Book Exchange. Before long, he had five campus bookstores in New York City at various colleges and universities. Uh, not many years later, in 1971, he bought Barnes & Noble, the Barnes & Noble bookstore on Fifth Avenue in New York City. At that time, Barnes & Noble was just, I believe, simply one store. From there, because Ruggio understood that retailing was coming to the book industry in a way just like it had been coming to everything else. And before long, Ruggio had 630 retail stores with 26,000 employees. And if you're a reader um, like me, uh, you likely l love your going to book Barnes & Noble and being surrounded by words and ideas and pictures and big comfy chairs. 
And if you go to the Barnes & Noble in Edina by Southdale, you can even order a meal. I don't know if you've been there, but it's pretty fascinating if you ask me. All of that's quite an accomplishment. But the reason I'm highlighting Riggio today is because of what I heard him say in New York. He truly enlightened me about a form of idealism that I hadn't been aware of, that I hadn't understood. So in New York, I heard Riggio talk about how classism um, had existed in the book industry in the 1950s and 60s. That classism was in the form that really the only respectable books were hardback books. They were considered the only the true books. And paperback books were thought of as second class. And in fact, many bookstores refused. That was the older, smaller retail, or re, smaller bookstores refused to carry uh, second class books that, that would be paperback books. <clears throat> and what Riggio saw was that paperback books were a way of bringing books to the masses. And he talked about this in New York. And as he was saying this, there are all kinds of wheels going off in my head. And I'm saying, you know what? I'm not just listening to a business owner here. I'm listening to somebody who had ideals and somebody who had values and somebody who actually thought about the greater good. And so what um, Riggio thought was that if he could get paperback books at lower prices out to the public, that they would represent a starter kit for people who wanted to learn about the world and enrich themselves. And paperback books allowed the middle class to assemble a real library. Our young listeners might not value that, but I can assure you I have a 28-year-old daughter who cherishes her books and her bookshelves. In fact, I've had the honor of uh, helping her put some of those bookshelves together. What I loved most about hearing Riggio was when he said, quote, a single book can change your life, unquote. And that's true. In fact, a single book can just do that. He finished by saying that Barnes & Noble and the work of all book retailers, quote, help make the world a better place, unquote. That is truly an idealistic statement and an idealistic goal. So what started out as a talk for me from some mega company executive really... Um, showed me that this guy, this Riggio guy, Len Riggio, was committed to books as an instrument for social change. And in his personal life, Riggio has shown up. I mean, he's actually not only walked, walked the walk, I mean, actually talked the talk, but he's actually done the walk as well. You get what I say. So uh, following, for example, following Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Riggio and his wife uh, created a nonprofit to help build homes in, in the devastated New Orleans area. And since then, they've built more than 100 homes for people who've been displaced by the flood. Not only did they build the homes, but they also furnished the homes. In 1996, Riggio organized and funded a Stand for Children march in Washington, D.C., uh, he's earned many awards, including the Frederick, Frederick Douglass Medallion. And in 2002, Riggio earned the Americanism Award from the Anti-Defamation League, citing his work to celebrate diversity and make the dreams of freedom and equality a reality for so many Americans. Think about this. We go to Barnes & Noble. We are surrounded by tens of thousands of books and titles. We get the opportunity to go in there. They allow you to go in and sit around for a whole lot. I mean, they're not ushering you out very much. And you get to sit there and you get to browse. You get to see the way the world might be different. You just pick up one book there, another book in another section, another book in a third section, and you can just sit and read. And better yet, for at least Riggio, you can also buy. This is incredible. We all know that in order for idealism to take hold, in order for this world to be better, we need to be curious. We do. Curiosity is incredibly important to idealism. Understanding and, and wondering about how other people live, how other societies, how other governments work, how people have gotten it right, and certainly in the history section, how people have gotten it wrong. I love this idea that books are an instrument of idealism 
And I really, really admire this Reggio guy, as you might be able to tell. And for me, what great serendipity for me to fall into this in New York City, thinking I'm going to a book expo. What am I? Nece- I, I wasn't necessarily all that thrilled about going, but of course, the things we do for our children. Um, but as I was sitting there in the opening remarks uh, and listening to Riggio, I was like, oh, gosh, El, guess what? You've got an idealist standing right here in front of you, an idealist just like you. There you go. So you've been listening to me, Ellie Krug, on Ellie 2.0, a different kind of radio show, one that taps into the idealism of all of us, where we long for a better, more inclusive world. That's really what makes America great. It does. I'd love to hear from you at Ellie 2.0. That's Ellie 2.0 radio at gmail.com. If you like what you hear, visit my website at elliekrug.com and sign up for my newsletter. The Ripple. People love The Ripple. We'll be back for a moment. Uh, we'll be back after this break for a little bit more. Thank you. At Pride Institute, being LGBTQ plus is the norm, not the exception. Their highly trained and skilled staff understand your issues and will help you live a happy, healthy life as a proud LGBTQ plus person. They offer you hope to overcome your addiction and live the life you want. Their treatment programs are designed to assist you in developing the knowledge, skills, and attitudes for long-term recovery. Therapy groups include health education, LGBTQ issues, HIV and chronic illness, trauma, grief and loss, transgender support, nicotine recovery, education, and sexual health. Pride Institute offers a residential treatment program, a partial hospitalization program that includes day programming with lodging, and an intensive outpatient program. If you or someone in your life can benefit from guidance and coping skills, life balance, and other tools necessary for long-term recovery, check them out at pride-institute.com or call 800-547-7433 now. With all the convenient big box stores that sell appliances, why do so many Minnesotans choose Warner Stellion? Check online to learn that Warner Stellion is a Minnesota family-owned business for over 60 years. Warner Stellion sells more brands than anyone else, and our passionate specialists are committed to impressing you so much that you'll refer us to everyone you know. That's our mission here at Warner Stellion. Ask around, check us out online, and when it's your time to buy appliances, join over 300,000 Minnesota homeowners and choose the specialists, Warner Stellion. Hi, this is Paul Metzler inviting you to listen to the Wall of Power Radio Hour every weekend on AM 950. We are now in our third year of broadcasting on the Progressive Voice of Minnesota. Min Post has called us one of the 22 most independently entertaining and cool radio shows in the Twin Cities. We feature cool people from all walks of life and from all 50 states. Every Saturday at 6 p.m., we played Sunday at 4 p.m. on AM 950, the Progressive Voice of Minnesota. Tap, taste, and treasure at Vinaigrette, where we have some warm seasonal recipes all ready to create dynamite meals. Our fig balsamic vinegar pairs perfectly with roasted Brussels sprouts or baked brie. And sweet potatoes are always a winner, but never more than when they're roasted with a drizzle of vinaigrette cinnamon or orange-fused extra virgin olive oil on top. Come in today for more custom-crafted food and cocktail recipes at Vinaigrette, 50th and Xerxes in Minneapolis and 287 Water Street in downtown Excelsior. Online at vinaigrettemn.com. This is Ken Hagland of Minnesota Hospice, inviting you to listen to our brand new show airing on AM 950 on Saturdays from noon to one. The Minnesota Hospice Show looks forward to discussing how we honor life and to exploring the physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional issues we experience throughout all stages of life. Learn how hospice is the new face of hope and how it's your benefit, your choice. Join us Saturdays at noon and check us out online at minnesotahospice.com. Welcome back to AM 950 and LE 2.0 radio where I'm not afraid to call myself a practical idealist and where I talk about how together we can make this world a better place. We've been talking about uh, Len Riggio in our first uh, uh, part of the show about him and his work at Barnes & Noble. I'd like now to talk about my work. And I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm actually pretty humble about things. And it's kind of odd that I have a radio station where, I, or a radio show where I would talk about 
um, my work and kind of talk about me and sound kind of egotistical because that's really not what I am. But, you know, the station owner really insists that I talk about the work that I'm doing. And as you know, I go across the country and I speak a great deal about human inclusivity. I also speak on motivational topics about how we individually, each of us, have it within ourselves to change our lives for the better. And what I'm... Uh, and what I'm finding is that, yes, I am making a difference. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from people in audiences who write to me afterwards and say, Ellie, that you, you've inspired me. Sometimes I even hear from somebody who says, you know, gosh, Ellie, I think your words are going to change my life. I know that's pretty big, isn't it? But, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, the way that my business works is that people hear about me. Um, usually by word, it's all usually by word of mouth. Sometimes people see me at a conference and they like me so much, so they go back to where they, where their business is or their organization. And they say, we need to bring her here to come and speak at our, at our organization, or they're, they're in charge of another conference and they want to bring me to that kind of, co that conference that they were. Sometimes it's their lieutenants who, um, you know, see me speak somewhere, and when I say lieutenant, not military lieutenant, but like trusted lieutenant within an organization, and they come back and they recommend me. Um, and, you know, sometimes people do go to my website at elitekrug.com, and they look at it, and they then uh, email me to see um, whether I'd be willing to talk. That doesn't happen all that often, because usually um, in this speaking and training business, people have to actually see you in action. You know, and I've got different trainings, one on Transgender 101, another on Workplace Allyship, and I've got some motivational talks. But by far, my most popular talk is one is named Gray Area Thinking, and it's about general human inclusivity, not transgender inclusivity or, or gay or lesbian or bisexual uh, inclusivity, but all human inclusivity. And uh, mechanically, the way that it works is that, you know, the sponsor invites me to come in and speak. They set up the space. And most importantly, for purposes of what I'm, the story I'm about, the stories I'm about to relate, is that the, the organization that hires me usually promotes me um, for the talk. So, you know, I give them copy. I say, you know, here's, here's what you can use in your promotional piece. Uh, and then they put it together in whatever format they want, and then they send it out to their constituents. Maybe it's their employees, if it's a company. Um, maybe it's their members, if it's going to be a conference, you know, members of organizations, whatever. But they send out the promo material. Um, if they provide the potential audience members with my bio, um, you know, somebody who's considering going to my talk, in my bio, they will readily see that I am transgender. Okay, it's right there. I talk about it. But if they don't provide my bio, and if they don't include in the promo that I'm transgender, well, you know what? The attendees will have no idea that I am transgender unless they actually go to the trouble of researching me. And not everyone does that. I tell you all of this because I want to relate two quick stories about me, a transgender person, and what's been and how that has become a tripwire for some audience members. So last year, I presented in a city in Iowa, um, a, a fairly small city, a metropolitan area of about two hundred thousand people. I presented it was I presented to county employees in that city, and I presented on gray area thinking. My general human inclusivity training. I did not check to see how my sponsor, that is the person who organized all of this for the county, I didn't check to see how they promoted the talk. That was a mistake on my part. And I ended up doing a lot of talks there. I did five two-hour sessions over two days. I think I reached a couple hundred employees doing all of that work. And that was all good until I got back the evaluations. My sponsor preceded those evaluations, sending those to me by apologizing and saying that they were very embarrassed by what some of the attendees wrote. And it turned out that in the audience at, at, this, um, at these talks in Iowa, there were several people who, who objected to transgender humans, not just to Ellie Krug, 
but to transgender humans in general. One person wrote that regardless of what I thought, I was a man, not a woman. Another person wrote that God doesn't make mistakes, and I should understand that. And three or four of the people who were at my uh, trainings uh, in their evaluations, well, I, I think they sort of liked the trainings, um, they misgendered me. They called me he and him. And all of this, I have to tell you, hurt. But what I came to figure out was that in the promo, when they sent it out to their county employees about Ellie Krug coming to speak, they didn't tell the audience that I was transgender. So obviously, there was some resentment by some of these folks about being trapped in a room with me for two hours. They trapped in a room with somebody they objected to. So I'm always learning. And I, you know, I don't have the market, uh, you know, cornered on wisdom. And so after that, I started asking about the promos and about whether or not they include in the promos that I'm transgender. And that gets me to story number two. Last month, um, I was at in a mid-Atlantic city at a conference of government officials. Most of these people were elected government officials from smaller towns and cities. And there were people from all across America. And we had, a, we had big cities, small towns, urban and rural, a whole mix. Given my experience in Iowa, um, I checked about the promo to see whether it included me as, um, referenced me as transgender, and they did not. They just included my name and a little bit about my background. So I have learned in those circumstances, those situations, to make a speech. And I related a speech to the audience members in which I said to them, you know, I'm transgender. I mean, this is at the beginning of the talk. I'm transgender. And I understand that in our country today, there are some people who, on religious grounds or other grounds, object to transgender people. I went on to say that I can't imagine anything worse than being stuck in a room for two hours with somebody that you object to. And I said, um, if you feel that you need to leave, it's okay with me. I won't judge you. But I went on and I said, but I'd really hope that you would stay, that you would uh, be willing to expand your perspective, that you'd be willing to maybe hear from me and, and possibly learn that just like you, all that I'm doing is trying to survive the human condition, that we have that in common. So I made that speech, you know, and, um, and you know, and some people would wince when I relate that I did this because they're like, how in the world would you apologize for yourself? But I, I'm, I've just got to tell you, I mean, there's nothing worse than having somebody in your talks who doesn't want to be there, okay? It doesn't help. And they, and they show it, and it, and it infects uh, the rest of the audience. So let's get them out of there if they don't want to be there. I, I made that speech. I looked around. Nobody got up. You know, 70 people in the room, they all stayed put. I thought, good. And I went forward and started the, started the training. Fifteen minutes later, I watched as one person... And then a second person got up and went out a side door. And I'll tell you, it really hurt when I saw it. But I didn't let it show. I am a professional. I went on and I finished the training and people really liked it. Later, I spoke with the conference organizer about it. Um, she had actually been in my training. And then when she saw those people leave, she went out in the hallway and uh, corralled them to talk to them. And she told me, um, essentially that one of them, yes, left because of uh, religious objections and the other um, left because they thought I was of trying to force my transgenderism on them. Transgenderism, by the way, isn't a word, but people who object to uh, trans people use it. I mean, it, it, it helped that the uh, sponsor was unfazed by all of it, um, but uh, it still, you know, left me feeling sad. And particularly left me sad that these are government people charged with carrying out laws and duties for all humans, for anyone within their jurisdictions. And the thought that they would treat people poorly on the basis of their presentation as transgender made me wonder how else will they treat poorly as well. As an idealist doing this work, you know, um, I understand that this is nothing compared to what Dr. King and Robert F. Kennedy went through. I know that. 
but I relate it to you because I do have these instances. And nonetheless, I persist because I believe in the work that I'm doing. I believe in my ability to make a difference in this world. I do. Well, there you go. You've been listening to me, Ellie Krug, with Ellie 2.0 and the radio. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Tell others about this show. We have much more work to do um, to take this show nationally, but I would love to do that. That is the ultimate goal. A big thanks to my producer, Brett Johnson. God, Brett, you are so wonderful. If you like what you hear, visit my website at elliekrug.com. Talk to you next week.